with the upcoming product live stream only being one week off, I think it's the perfect time to extrapolate on last week's discussion where we talked about how gift markers could change up the dynamic of going first and going second with what type free markers can potentially be. So join me in this week's discussion about the potential of new type free markers, what they can do, what they can potentially be, and what Bushroad might reveal next week. Hey car fighters, welcome back to another car fight discussion and today I want to discuss the potential of type 3 markers. I'm not suggesting that we will get type 3 markers next week, but there is a highly likely chance that if we go by from the past that this product live stream we will see the likelihood of a reveal of a gift type free marker. So before I go into every single aspect, there is an important thing to keep in mind with what my personal ideas or suggestions are going to be. As with these new type of markers, there are two main things that I'm looking for when I myself are going to look into the possibility. Because from new type of markers, I either expect from them to give us more choices or at least give us more options during different situations. So a player has more tools to their disposal when dealing with different situations. Or these new type of gift markers need to give us new types of mechanics, new interactions and new possibilities for card design. What I mean with that is that the gift markers themselves don't necessarily need to be a new mechanic, but they need to allow for the possibility of a future type of mechanic. A good example of this, and I know people don't like it, but it is Protect 2. All the other gift markers are very generic, they just give more options, but Protect 2 opened up the possibilities of new mechanics and Bush wrote it is finally hunkering down on that aspect as we've got the whole evil decoy token with Nubatama and we're going to see that the new Angel Feather cards are going to be centered around this Protect 2 type of gift marker. So we have to wait to see what they're going to do. As I honestly don't believe we would have got the evil decoy token mechanic if we never got Protect 2. So either more options or the possibility of more mechanics. Those are the two things that I'm looking for when coming up with these suggestions or when I want to make a case for a certain mechanic or a certain gift marker. So with that said, let's dive into the different aspects. First off, we have the normal markers and the generic things that we're used to that are in the same vein of type one and type two. And I have two suggestions for each marker type. So let's start off with force. The first one is basically inspired by Axel 2. It's basically give a circle plus 5k and draw a card. So it's similar to how Axel 2 is a little bit weaker than Axel 1, but the trade-off is that you get a draw. This fits perfectly with the whole concept of force, as force is meant to be the balanced type. As protect is defensive, Axel is aggressive, and force is balanced. With the less power but the extra draw, you basically go towards the whole balance aspect as you do get a bit more power onto the field, but you also retain some shield value as you get more cards into your hand. This just gives force decks a bit more options if they either want to go with full high numbers, want to push with crits, or they want just want to be more of a value game and want to have a bit more defensive options so they can go into the late game place. This could potentially work very well with Gancelot as it is a late game deck where you want to have your opponent sitting on grade three. So if you went first, the deck doesn't really do a lot. So having this type of marker, it helps the deck quite considerably. It also works wonders for something like Mordred as you can draw a lot of things. Sure, it can also be a little bit overpowered if you combine it with something like Bermuda Triangle, but it wouldn't be the first time when a new type of gift marker is going to make the Bermuda deck even stronger than it already was. But the other type of marker that could potentially be a thing, and I'm more in this type of ballpark, it's a little bit far-fetched, but it opens up a lot of possibilities for different a concept for deck designing, attack patterns, as well as skill design. And what I'm suggesting to is basically the Axel variant for force. With Axel, every time you get a new Axel marker, you will get a new column to the left, a new column to the right, left, right, left, right, and build up a front row. With force three, what we can see is an extension of the columns themselves in the vertical line. So we get more boosters behind our columns. Every time you get a force three marker, you can either put a extra back row behind your back row for the left column, center column or right column, depending on where you want to put it, you have full control over that. So you can extend your column from bottoms up. So you have a, your normal back row and you get another back row behind it. They can just keep it at that or they can also give that circle 
every unit on top of that the boost ability. So you can just put a grade 3 behind it and you can empower your column. This might sound weird, but what this entice is that you will get more value out of all your boost skills. As now, you can have two boosters in that same column, as they can boost the attacker in the front row, and you can combine different boost abilities to have some all kinds of wacky interactions or combinations within a single attack, as now you can stack two boost abilities in one single attack. That can be two on hit skills, that can be two generic on boost abilities that can give powers or skills so you can have all kinds of crazy combination going on. What also is possible is now that Vanguard boosters will become a lot better because the problem with Vanguard boosters right now is that you have only one spot on the field that makes it valuable and once that spot is filled all the other cards are going to be useless as they won't have any value and they're just shield value and that's it. So there is a high chance that Vanguard boosters are very rarely run. But now that you can extend that Vanguard booster column to more circles, suddenly Vanguard boosters become a lot better. What also can be suggested, depending on how they're going to incorporate this mechanic, if they're going to do it, is that you maybe have some free reign in boosting. So, for example, you have a we have multiple boosters behind a front row unit, and they can state that the mechanic works as follows, that all those boosters can immediately boost that unit in, in the front row at the same time, so you can give a lot of power, or they can boost separately depending on how many circles you can boost one and then use another one for the second attack and use another one maybe use two others for the second attack and depending on how many boosts you have you have free reigns over that this means that restanding abilities for vanguards and rear guards suddenly become a lot better as now you can boost multiple times of those attacks as you have a booster for the first attack and then a booster for the second attack if you have another booster behind it that is Pretty good in something for Clarence Sword, as it can now boost multiple Vanguard attacks as you have multiple boosters behind it. And it also gives you more options for attack patterns, as you have more options between when you want to boost with a certain unit, do you want to boost entirely in the front first attack, or save every power for the second attack, or spread them around. You have way more options to build your field in this way. And it also opens up the room for different kinds of grade 2 and grade 3 designs that will have on boost abilities or gain the boost ability, depending if those circles will give units on top of them boost or not. Now, unfortunately, let's dive into Axel. And Axel is it's pretty generic as there's not a lot you can do with already having the extra circles in the front row. But what they can do, one example, is that instead they're going to give more circles to the Axel clans they will change the back row circles one by one into secondary front row circles. So basically units on top of that circle can attack from the back row. And to balance it out with XL1 and XL2, the unit can either get a plus 10k or a plus 15k. I'm lingering more on a plus 15k as you also are sacrificing the boost capability for the unit in front of it. So your attacks are going to be weaker in some sort. So to compensate that, giving unit in the back row a plus 15k will balance it out a bit more so you can leave your grade 3s in the front row and your grade 2s and grade 1s in the back row so they can hit as well. What it entices is that it still allows Axel players to multi-tag, but they are going to sacrifice overall power for that. And they have a limit to the amount of things they're going to generate as you have only three back rows and that's about it. After that, the Axel, after more Axel markers, it doesn't really do that much anymore. But what it allows you to do is have a little bit more control on the board. You're not going to pump more cards onto the field. So against disruption clans or field wipe clans, you're not minusing as hard as you just have a limited amount of units onto the board. But what also is great is that it works against damage denying tactics. As what Axel is all about is spreading out through the front row, start attacking. But then once it's your opponent's turn, they can deny you damage and potential power plays and just ram into your rear guards, minusing you a lot. And then the following turn, you cannot do as much because you don't have open counter blast and you just lost a lot of cards and you just falter and next turn they can kill you even though your opponent basically skipped the turn by just attacking to your rear guards. By having the ability to attack from their back row, then this be almost becomes a non-issue. You do sacrifice some power for some attacks in the front row, but some clans can mitigate this, well, like Tachikazu with the equip gauge on something like Sweeper Aqua Kanto, and there are some plays to play around it. But you do limit the amount of attacks, some power is negated because boosters will be less prevalent for this type of Axel decks and you can therefore maybe change these type of uh, uh, power up from the markers by just stating that the only that the unit on the circle only gains the power when itself is attacking so you won't get the boost 
when you just put a grid one on top of that circle and just boost with the entire column. Another thing that it can go for Excel free is that instead of extra circles or instead that they're going to get extra background attacks is that that circle has an inherent once per turn recent capability for any unit onto that circle that might sound overpowered but you are going to sacrifice other potential multi-tackings as you have less different units that are going to attack but you can have certain specific units attack twice and already inherent restenders within certain clans can then suddenly attack twice. But what this gift marker really needs to focus on is that, that if they're gonna do that with that recent ability, that needs to be a hard once per turn because some clans will abuse the shit out of it if it's not a once per turn and just once per turn for that unit. Because something like Aggravain that can just recall on top of that circle will get another additional extra tech out of it. The balance aspect in this case is that that circle will not give extra power. It just allowed the unit on that circle to restand. So not everybody can abuse this and not every archetype and deck can use this because they are not going to get extra circles onto the field. So something like the new last card Revan cannot really use it as effectively as they need a certain amount of units resting. So without the extra circles, having that can be a little bit tough but the extra reset up capabilities can give certain decks a lot of value as strong on attack skills can suddenly be used twice even though that unit shouldn't be able to restand naturally now onto protect markers and this is going to be my personal favorite versions protect free can either be a generic 20k shield in hand but i don't think that's enough i think it would be balanced by also getting an extra draw so the marker is a 20k shield in hand, but also plus one draw. So similar to how Axel 2 works, just like my potential force free version that you get an extra draw out of it. This allows you to combat Axel decks quite heavily as you now have potentially two cards extra in hand that can help you defend against two different attacks. But it at the same time isn't enough against most force attacks as those will probably be above that 40k in a lot of scenarios. So having protect one is still more favorable and protect two is still more favorable for certain decks that utilize the aspect of protect two like the evil decoy token and the potentially new angel feathers. Another possible option for protect three is a different version of protect two and it takes a little bit of inspiration from Hearthstone as well as the new Vanguard Zero mobile game and that is the act of taunt. What I mean with that is that once you get a protect one marker one of your front row circles and you can basically only stack it up to two as you have your left circle and your right front row circle those circles or at least the units on those protect marker circles will gain the taunt ability and what it entices is that if there's a unit on that circle your opponent is forced to first kill that unit with an attack or just at least remove it before they can attack into your vanguard. This allows you to have some extra defensive capabilities with any type of card. You can just place a great free on there and they first need to deal with that unit before they can attack into your vanguard with their other attacks. And there are some variations that they can attach on top of it because they can just leave it at that. But I think that it's still a bit too weak. So either they can give it some build-in protection. So you cannot retire it or you cannot remove it by targeted uh, abilities or it just states that it can only be removed by battle so any type of control doesn't work against it. That might be a little bit too overpowered as a lot of decks will falter. What it can also do is that it gives the units a little bit of power so any type of unit on top of that need to be beat over with a sizable unit. So they can say plus 5k power so even grid ones with 8k body turn into 13k meaning some generic grade 1 and grade 2 cannot remove it they either need to use a full booster or they need to waste a grade 3 attack into that unit before they can attack with a vanguard that's also a possibility for protect free it's somewhat like a taunt effect and those are what the generic type 3 markers could look like these are just suggestions as there are a lot of different options then there are still two other options left or two main topics to discuss we have legendary type markers and this is not my original idea this was suggested by one of the comments on the previous discussion video from last week that somebody discussed and it, it, it it's an interesting concept as what it basically entices is that it can be two two it can either be two things either it gives you it it, it gives players that went second or players that go into the grid three second a more powerful option. It can either be that the player that that player is going to get the option to use 
either type 1 or a type 2 marker, but they're not restricted to that choice for the follow-up marker. So the first marker you're going to get can be a force 2, so you have to crit, but then you generate some generic force 1 markers afterwards, and that's going to be the marker you're going to lock in. So you have one force 2 and a lot of force 1. This can be a powerful thing, as in certain decks, having access to force 1 and force 2 can be very powerful, as you can have at least a generic double crit column with a lot of power just right there. That is pretty good. But what also can be a thing, and this was suggested by somebody else, was that you will have a powerful marker, a type 3 that's super powerful, but it can only be activated on the person going grade 3 when the opponent is also grade 3. However, the person going to grade 3 first can also gain this marker, but it will be inactive until his following turn. Meaning the player going first can either have the choice to gain normal markers, type 1 and type 2, or gain this super marker, but they not going to get the value until the following turn. Then the player going second to grade 3 basically can get this super powerful marker and immediately have benefit from it to combat going second quite a bit in that regard. So it's somewhat talking about the discussion from last week and incorporated with today's topic. So it's an interesting concept. I'm not sure if they're going to go this route as there is a lot of problems that will arise from this and also how powerful are they going to make this type 3 markers and will this only be attained for type 3 or will it be from type 3 onwards? It does have some complications with it unless they're not going to call it type 3 and they're going to give it a different name so it's very easy to distinguish between each other so it depends on which route they're going to take. It's an interesting concept nonetheless so I thought it was worth to mention at least in the video. And the last thing I want to talk about is also something I've seen in the comments and also discuss on different uh, threads as well. And that's our the defensive disrupt markers. And for anybody that's familiar with Yu-Gi-Oh, it's somewhere in the vein of hand traps. And how it can potentially work is that these markers, you can attain them by normal means of the markers that you can write that and gain them. Somebody also suggests that you can gain them by discarding Great Freeze and then get into hand. So you somewhat are mitigated, so you can somewhat have control over getting them, but discarding aggressively all your great freeds can somewhat disrupt your right capabilities, so there is something to talk about that, but let's just keep it in a normal sense. So basically what it can do is, you get a marker to hand, and then you can use this whenever your opponent is trying to activate an ability to cancel that effect. Is that a good thing? It's completely up to debate. People can say yes, people can say no, because it depends on what your stance is in how you want to play a game. I know people don't like the fact that plays can be disruptive, but at the same time, playing against somebody and then watching their entire turn unfold and you can do nothing about it is also a bit annoying. Especially against combo-heavy decks, it can do all kinds of crazy attacks, attack for multiple times and all kinds of things and you're, he's going to OTK you right then and there. Having this kind of disruptive option to mitigate their advances and using it at the right timing or the right thing can open up a lot of competitive options and a lot of skill-based plays as now with something like an effect failure for, uh, for Vanguard, it depends on the player timing it correctly at the right time as disrupting the right skill at the right moment can mean the entire game, but disrupting the wrong skill at the wrong moment can mean you abs did absolutely nothing. And at the same time, for the player that's playing his current turn, for him, it's it's basically becomes a mind game to use the right skills in the right in the right combination and trying to uh, force your opponent to use that counter ability on the wrong skill or at the wrong time, so you can still navigate around it and play to your full capabilities. And the main difference between this and for players that are familiar with Yu-Gi-Oh is that we at Vanguard, if this becomes a thing. With the gift markers, we are 100% sure if our opponent has one in hand. Because if they're going to get one to hand, then we can see the card in their hand because gift markers have a different sleeve. Unless they're going to go with the route that somebody suggested that you discard a great free, then you gain it, then you gain the ability and you can use it. Then it's a different thing, but I don't think that that's the correct way to go, go with it. So... It depends on how you want to play it. I think having control or at least options within your opponent's turn like we had in the GR with something like Denial Griffin, Impede Dragon and whatnot is a good thing as it allows for more options. This is the reason why I like Shiryuki as a card even though a lot of people hate the card because it gives the player control options during the opponent's turn so you have some say in the matter when your opponent is trying to kill you during that turn. You have interaction with your opponent. 
And I know not a lot of people like that, but there are also a lot of people that do like that. And that's basically all the options for the potential new gift markers. I know there are a lot of things that we went over. We have the normal markers as well as these legendary type markers, as well as the defensive options. So let me know in the comments down below what your personal opinion is about every single subject. Either you like certain uh, designs from the markers, uh, different aspects of the markers, or maybe you have a different uh, concept of what these new type of free markers can potentially be if we do go to get them. As for last week's discussion about going first or going second, how the gift markers could interact with that, I got a lot of interesting comments and also things that need to be clarified as there was a lot of confusion going on in the comments with people watching the video and the topic that I discussed. And the first comment is, of course, of none other than Suzuka Moiren. And he basically thought it was a bad idea because certain decks are gonna be eliminated as certain decks need to generate markers on turn two or turn three to make their thing go live. Think of the new Genesis Astral Plane deck or even the Mordred Phantom Blaster Dark build where you generate a lot of force markers. But some people caught on to what I was referring to as I was specifically talking about the on right gift marker, the icon on the card that generates the gift marker. Special abilities like we've seen with Genesis or with uh, Bless the Dark with the whole Mortal Defender build, those are exempt of that rule that I discussed in that video because I was generally talking about the normal generation of markers themselves. It will hinder the Genesis as well as the Mortal Defender build in some capacity, but not much. They only lose out one marker. The mom that one marker is going to make a difference, but it will not outright make the decks unplayable. So every special type of ability, even like Hemske, are still going to be usable even when they went first. Then Javier Gota made the uh, suggestion that markers would only be activated during the second ride, but you will attain them. This could work and it could balance it somewhat, but it depends on if it's if if that's the way you want to go, because it will generate some confusion as you will still get the marker onto the field but you cannot use them, so it will generate some confusion if you either can use them or not, because you still have them. If you get a protect marker, it's in your hand, but you need to remember while it's in your hand, you cannot use it. Same as with Axel markers, it's on the field, and with force markers, it's on the field, but I cannot use them. That will probably generate a lot of confusion, and I don't think that's the elegant way to fix it. It can be an option, but I think it generated more confusion than it fixed problems. Uh, Audi made a very interesting suggestion where the going first, the going second is decided on the type of marker you play and what space that occupies in the whole power triangle within the gift marker system. And this is an interesting concept. I don't think it's completely uh, on flawed because there are flaws within this, but it is an interesting topic to talk about. And maybe I'm gonna talk about it in a separate video further down the line as it takes away from other tabletop games. If you're familiar with war games like Warhammer or Star Wars Armada and that kind of uh, miniature games, you play, you make a build and depend, and you have a maximum amount of points that you can use. And the amount of points is equal to the amount of power your build is going to be. And the player with the least amount of points is the player that will go first. So sometimes in, in tournaments, the player is building and strategizing around a certain aspect of points to get first or always be second depending on their build. So it, it, it will give an extra in-depth strategy before the game is actually played out. And this could also be the case with Vanguard if we t adapt something like this as when you go into a tournament and you know your locals or your regionals has a certain amount of marker being used a lot, you can then use the opposite marker, the, the weaker marker, so to speak, to always go first, to have that advantage of going first. So it's an interesting concept that could be used and there are some interesting discussion topics that uh, comes out of this uh, concept so it's interesting to talk about and will maybe will be discussed later down the line flame cubes i don't know what kind of sec relations thing you went through but if something like that is the case for a normal tcg that would be anarchy i mean just imagine what type of regionals you're going to have so many judge calls are going to be called that i honestly think that Normal judges can be a thing. There needs to be a separate educational level to make good enough judges for this type of scenarios as it will just be anarchy all over the place. And I don't know how Bakugan made that possible, but 
if they ever tried something like this in a normal TSG, especially in Vanguard where you have already the attacking and defending and uh, uh, during d during one turn, having both players doing the same time, it can be nuts. The final thing I wanted to discuss is that a lot of people were discussing that the person going second to grid three will have too much power and this will result to a new wave of grade two gaming. And there is something to say for that, that that might be the case, but I honestly don't think that that will be the end result if they would ever incorporate that new kind of rule, because there is a big difference between the G era and the current V era with how decks function and how they work, because there is a reason why grade two gaming was a prevalent thing during the G era, and that was generation break. The problem was at the time is that your entire deck didn't do anything until you strode. So that meaning that the first three turns you were playing vanilla and then suddenly when you strike, your entire deck was live and you could do all kinds of crazy combinations. That was a significant power difference that made grade two gaming reasonable. Even though you were playing with vanilla because getting that first strike, especially with the, all the more powerful units that we're getting later down the road during the G era, made that sacrifice valid with the current v era that's no longer the case or at least that is less likely the case because your skills are already live on turn one you can use your grade ones on grade one you can use your grade twos on grade twos the only thing that are in life are your grade three vanguard abilities or grade three vanguard abilities that need to have a certain amount of cards or a specific grade in soul that takes a couple of while that takes a couple of turns to get but there is no gigantic power difference between going from grade two grade three the the big problem here is that you get twin drive you get your vanguard center grade three abilities and you get your gift markers on top of that if you remove that gift marker from the first player going first the player going first will still go to grade three in most ca cases as you still get your twin drive and you still get your super powerful vanguard centric skills you only lose that gift marker you are a lot of players are willing to take that sacrifice to still go into their first powerful turn as they're still full powered by that time. And you're not losing a lot of value out of that marker itself, especially if we take note that I only referring to the generic right face marker. So something like Blast the Dark, they can still regain their markers by just calling Blast the Darks onto the field. Hemske can still get an extra marker. All the Genesis cards can still get those extra markers. So there is less likely or less incentive to great stall at a time. Sure, there are different aspects to it because you have force and you have extra protect with the different base power, but that will allow different type of decks and different types of play styles shine in a different in a different format that wasn't otherwise the case. And that sums up everything from last week's episode. As always, I want to thank my Patreon supporters over Patreon for making this video and everything on the channel possible. You guys are amazing. If you do want to support the channel, then head over to patreon.com slash Insider and become a Patreon today. But with that said, I'm Mr. Timeleap and I see you guys in the next one. <laughs>